our um, discussion rather uh, I would say presentation uh, maybe we will have a discussion towards the end on the mandal. So I know it is a very esoteric concept and um, it can mean many things uh, but the meanings that I want to draw your attention to are how is this idea um, the basis of landscapes uh, that we consider to be very sacred in the Indian subcontinent. And today, how is the mandal the basis for architecture um, that again we consider to be very, very important. Um, okay. I'm going to extend the discussion of mandal in the building to mandal in the um, urban form as well, which is a kind of landscape, uh, taking the example of temple towns in southern India. So let me ask you, um, once again, um, what do we make of this mandal? We said it's a circle, we said the circle wants to be a square. Um, we said the mandal is a symbol of unity, totality, right? And then we said, oh, the mandal is also a microcosm. So let us see uh, what we mean by microcosm. Okay. A smaller version of cosmos. Now, cosmos is the universe, um, and all of the universe, you know, the known and the unknown, to distill it into an icon, that is what the mandal is doing. So, it becomes an icon, a symbol of something much larger. And for the ancient um, ancients um, here in this part of the world, it was very important for them um, to make places where they could connect um, with the divine. In other words, they wanted always a place to be auspicious. Okay. Now the word auspicious, we use it, okay, this is a good time, you know, this is a good place, it's auspicious time, you get married in auspicious times, you know, uh, this is an auspicious occasion. Um, uh, so um, auspiciousness meaning the right time, a, a time of beginnings, um, a time of great happenings, that's precisely the kind of time and the kind of space the ancients were after. Are you with me here? In a secular worldview, we don't often think, you know, um, about how important a place or time should be um, because um, in the world of machines, in the world dominated by the scientific worldview, in an objective world, one place could be like the other, one time could be like the other. The clock and the watch, you know, divides the 20, the, the hour, um, the days, the day and night into equivalent time periods and each time period could be like the other. That is a neutral objective way of looking at time. Okay. Similarly, space um, could be neutral until we make a place, unless until we invest it with meaning. So here, um, that's what the ancients were doing. They were making places, they were investing it with meaning and that meaning was that they were in direct communion um, with, uh, with something higher themselves. So something which was transcendent above and beyond was then brought back, was brought down to something close, imminent.
do you think we still could appreciate Mandal in today, in contemporary world? The idea of a sacred time and a sacred place, is that of relevance to us? So you're saying, you're nodding your head, yeah. It is. And um, it is because, yes. Yes, exactly. Oh, that makes me feel very good. <laughs> yes, so this is a special, this is a place invested, you know, with your intention and with meaning and with significance. So similarly, you know, a mandal is, a, is an occasion. It's a special temporal entity, as I said. It's an occasion and it is a, it is a place where um, there could be communication um, with the divine and, and imbibing the energies of, of something bigger than yourself. Um, so um, this in a nutshell, um, is what the mandal is and we use the word the word used in different languages could mean um, in different contexts could mean something different but it is um, for instance a mandal as an assembly and so on um, uh, but I think this is the most popular understanding um, here uh, in in uh, in India and Nepal and uh, in other parts of the world, in East Asia, um, uh, in the Buddhist, in the context of Buddhism. Uh, now, when a place and a time uh, is invested with, in, uh, with meaning, um, uh, that, form, that place could have any form, but the ancients chose a perfect form, a square, okay. Well, let me back up. The circle was a perfect form and it became squared when the need came to build, to build temples, to build houses, to build cities. It's not that easy to build round temples and round, I mean, there are round houses and round temples. Um, but the right angle, I think, <laughs> is easier. For some reason, uh, we, you know, the Euclidean, you know, the geometry of Euclidean geometry is, is you know, the human invention and is, you know, is, is what is used, you know, to, to create, uh, to design habitats. And the point I was making yesterday was that we have to also think about Mandal in terms of, of it being a, um, a dynamic structure uh, and um, that uh, is ever generated and regenerated. Okay. So the pilgrims are inscribing a mandal. Okay. The devotee in a temple is, 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 is inscribing a mandal by going around the deity and is, is demarcating a sacred zone by that very action. cosmic evolution and dissolution, the ancients were very interested in how, like you are, how the world came into being. And you, you, you know, it's a big bang theory, or at least that's what um, the astronomers tell us. Um, and uh, for, would you come forward, please? Um, uh, would you come forward and, and For, 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 um, for this society, um, living in the Indo-Gangetic Plains, um, however number of years, however 3,000, 5,000 years ago, they believed that the world came into being because the, because the gods willed it to be, okay? It was created, the world was created by the gods and cosmos evolved and then it ended, it destroyed itself. So there was a cycle of um, 
evolution and dissolution, which is kind of captured, you know, in a circular form, just as um, we understand, you know, nature, we feel nature to have these, you know, these rhythms of nature are the, the birth, the growth, and the senescence, the end. So I'm not going to spend too much time on this because I think we can keep, we can really go into a great deal of, um, um, we can think a great deal on what these concepts mean, but I just want to kind of lay out to you um, what I'll be presenting. I'm going to talk about the mandal in um, context, a special kind of mandal, which is a Vastu Purush mandal. And I'm going to um, talk about mandal patterns, um, the square and the family of squares um, and the gridded square. And I'm going to show you a few examples of, um, uh, of uh, the house of God, which is a temple. Okay. I repeat, I'm not an art historian or an architectural historian. Um, so I, I, I use these illustrations not to trace the genesis of a style or to, sh or to look at, you know, analyze um, the stylistic variations in different parts of the country. Um, but I, I, I show these examples to illustrate the central idea um, that the temple um, is a symbol of cosmogony. So I just said the temple is a house of gods, right? And in Hinduism, um, uh, the deity is worshipped um, because it is said to it is it is uh, it contains the uh, the it is the receptacle of of divinity. That was not always so, as you know. Um, but once deity worship came into vogue, then there had to be a place um, uh, to house the deity. And you could say that the temple is, uh, is the residence of the gods. Um, but those who have studied temple architecture believe that it's not just a, a bhuvan, it is not just a house, um, it is more than that. A temple is more than that, and it it is in in a symbolic form all of cosmos, all of the universe. And they tell us that it is not a static symbol of cosmos, the world as they imagine, but it is a cosmos which is alive and is moving. It's dynamic and there is a contradiction here because a static structure, a structure made of brick masonry, a stone masonry, you know, is fixed, right? It doesn't, it's not moving. So how on earth are you going to um, communicate this idea that the cosmos is not still? It's growing, it's evolving. And it's coming to an end. And so this is where the genius of the um, temple architects lies, how they were able to communicate movement in a static structure. Um, I also want to bring in a third uh, meaning of uh, temple, temple as a house of God, temple as a symbol of cosmogony, of cosmos, the birth of cosmos, Cosmogony as, you know, that's, that's the study of cosmos as it comes about. Um, the word axis mundi, um, meaning axis again of the universe. And the third, um, the third meaning I want to um, expound is that the temple is also an imitation of natural forms, natural archetypes, archetypal forms the great mountains and the great rivers. And um, the temples um, were built, but they can be also traced to, um, to um, worship in the caves. So the caves were excavated. Um, and I think this um, throws light on the idea that the core of the temple, 
the very center of the temple called the Garbhagriha, the womb house, which is like a cave, um, is the place of birth, of, gest of gestation and birth of the cosmos, of the universe. And the basic form of the temple, its superstructure, is composed of little, little temples, small temples. And the word used here is adicule, adicule, a little shrine. And the way these temples are arranged, they give the impression of emergence, of centrifugal ex emergence, expansion, projection, staggering, splitting, uh, progressive multiplication, expanding repetition. And so, you know, so it is that the universe is, you know, growing, 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 and so is the temple. We are imitating, the big superstructure is imitated in small structures, mimesis. The bigger pattern is, um, is there in a smaller pattern, a self-similarity, like the fractals you find um, in nature. So, uh, to my understanding, this actually seems rather obvious that when our, for example, there is a concept that nature, if you look at all the petals of the flower, they are all in Fibonacci numbers. So, we can understand the fact that we perceive uh, nature as something that has much more force and, and much more time than compared to us. So, it can create things that we cannot. So, when we, to the highest level of aesthetics that we aim to attain should was, would obviously be something that would directly mimic the nature because nature is something that can make something so grand mm. and we would think like the best way to yes. create the most beauty is to mimic directly mimic nature uh -huh. so our goal would be to create such buildings that directly mimic the entire nature okay, okay and where you kind of did you take time to look at all that is around you um, did you feel that you know the whole world is there, you know. Usually our attention is taken with the idea of darshan um, to, you know, to pay respects to the to the deity, take prasad and um, maybe participate in, a, in an event. And we rarely have time, you know, to look at the outside. Maybe when you're doing parikrama, maybe you, you know, um, you pay obeisance to the gods who are on the, on the outer side. Um, so, but but I think the temple architects were very consciously um, uh, thinking about these principles, and the beauty of this is to come forward, come forward, please. And the beauty of this design of the form is that it was adhered to for such a long period, for such a long period, for a thousand years at least between 500 um, you know uh, ce to um, to um, 17th century um, at least in southern india and northern and western and eastern india around 13th century um, and today we do see grand temples um, um, those like akshardham which are mimicking the older, um, more traditional temples. But by and large, I think the local shrine, the small temple is um, uh, a replica without the exuberance, the sculptural exuberance and the sheer, you know, richness um, of, 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 of these um, more older temples. Okay, so, the temple is based upon a mandal pattern, okay? Uh, and in this uh, image, um, you see um, a mandal. You see made of um, rice flour, a, a diagram, right? And in this, di there are small, you know, squares made, and the gods are invited to take their seat. And this small square, rectangle, instantly becomes a sacred space. So the point I was making yesterday was that place is 
made from a continuum of space. So the ground all around, um, you know, is just kind of, you know, profane, like neutral. It has got no character. But suddenly, suddenly, um, this becomes a sacred site for a short period of time. How long? Maybe an hour, maybe two hours, maybe a day. Not longer than this. So this priest is helping uh, this man um, communicate with the divine and he's doing it via the medium of placemaking. I want to ask you this question. Were the gods always around? Were the gods always around? Our great gods, Vishnu and Shiva, they were always around. That is, that is a belief. Names will be different. Names will be different. Okay. Um, were they worshipped? in the deity form, the form of a deity. So, um, what, what is happening here, fire worship? You said fire worship, but what, is, what exactly does that mean, fire worship? The whole idea in a, in a, in a Vedic sacrifice uh, is to celebrate life, but the birth of life which is preceded by destruction. Okay. And um, sacrifice was an integral part of worship. The gods created the world and humans are mimicking that action. So any act of building um, um, any act which is um, uh, to be celebrated has to be celebrated um, with the understanding that the new comes out of the old. The phoenix rises from the ashes, that kind of, you know, that. So here we have a sacrificial altar um, and there are prescriptions on designing this. Um, go back to fourth, third century BC. And here maybe lies, you know, the genesis of um, the mandala patterns of um, later temples. And um, again, I want to bring in directionality in the circle. Um, directions are very important. We worship the sun also, right? So if you're on the ghats, you know, always on the rubber banks, you're always facing the sun, worshipping. The Surya himself is a kind of a lesser god than the great gods, um, Shiva and Vishnu. Um, so when directionality has bring, comes into, you know, and, and um, then um, now there is an articulation of directions and then there are guardian deities. Um, so uh, four, north, south, east, west, from there eight, and from there 16, and here you see, um, you know, the gnomon, um, which helps, which ha helped uh, the designers uh, to determine east and west through the, you know, the, the shadow of the sun. On this, on the, on the circle. Um, And they believed, you know, when the cosmos is coming into being, something was being destroyed. And that what was destroyed was a Purush. And a new, and, the, and then the Purush, you know, is um, again come into being. And this is probably a little, um, I don't know, too, too much to, <laughs> to appreciate. Um, but I, all I want to say is that the Purusha Sukta hymn of Rig Veda, um, kind of lays out, you know, the gestalt of the universe in terms of the human body. And this human body, this Purusha, 
um, uh, is, you know, um, can think of him of it of him it at different levels, like a demigod or the purusha of the spirit, you know, the big uh, the grand the transcendent spirit. And I bring it up not to um, say, you know, this is a very important hymn and so on and so forth or that the social order, the social order that it articulates is the one that um, uh, is, you know, um, is to be appreciated. Um, the, the, the point I'm here making is that just as you think of the cosmos in terms of galaxies and so on, these ancients thought of it in organic terms, like a giant human body okay, that was, that disintegrated and then it was born anew in the, in sacrifice. And Vasu Purush Mandal, here you see this Purusha form, the human form. Would you come, would you come closer? It's motivating for me, you know, to speak when I see, when I can actually see your faces. So this, this form is, is adjusted into the square, as you see in this diagram. How many of you have heard of Vastu Purush Mandal? Vastu Purush Mandal? Yes. In what context? So you've heard about Vas you've actually seen the Vastu Purush Mandal in temples, and I'm going to say it's not just South Indian; it's like you know all temples are based on Vastu. The same idea. Um, have you have you ever um, heard about this Mandal in context of house building? Yes. Are there any architects here? Yeah. What? Okay. Oh, Mr. Bibi Doshi. But, <laughs> but any architect, um, you know, any practicing architect uh, would be, would likely come across a client and will say, you know, I need, I need this house to be um, auspicious house. And I need you to know your Vastu Purush Mandal. I need you to put your, my, my toilets and my kitchen and my you know, puja her in exactly the right places so that this house, you know, becomes, brings prosperity, health and happiness to me and my family, right? So, yeah, what's going on here? So, we see the Purush, you know, uh, fitted into the square facing northeast. Um, that's the direction of the Vedic deity, sun, water. Um, um, and I think these are kind of arbitrary because I've seen a lot of Vastu Purush Mandas and I, I know Agni is fire and it's in the southeast direction and Vayu is in the northwest direction. And, but they don't always match, I think. I, I, I'm kind of skeptical. And Yam, Yam is always on the, south, on the south. So what is happening here is that at the beginning, um, at the beginning of construction, a house, a temple, even a city, um, the mandal is the mandal diagram is drawn. Um, a havan is 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 carried out, and the spirit of the site, the spirit of the site, who may not be um, all that well disposed towards you, is subdued so that these other gods come and take their place and make the site auspicious for you to build a house or a temple. You see what I'm saying? Nature in Hinduism is not always benign. Our gods are benign, but nature is not always benign. Nature can be benevolent, malevolent. The yakshis and the yakshini, uh, yakshas and yakshinis uh, um, 
of of um, the Buddhist era when they were carved, they were seen, you know, they were tamed, they were voluptuous entities, they were tamed um, because, because they could be angry, but they could be also very kind to you. And so something higher was needed. Um, and that um, that higher spirit, you know, we call, you know, as, as a transcendent, you know, Brahman. So, and then these gods, these Vedic gods, you know, have a kind of a lower status. Anyway, but these gods are benign and they've come and taken their position in the mandal of the, of the Vasapurush mandal. And so now your longevity is assured. I always say everybody is a designer. One of my, you know, professors, um, when I was studying at UC Berkeley, I was a chemist by training and I think he had more profound things to say about the nature of design than anybody else. Um, and I, when I started reading about um, uh, these manuals of Shilpa Shastras and Vastu Shastras, it was the same definition. Uh, to design is to bring form into existence by measuring and ordering space. And the beauty, I think, of um, this philosophy of design um, in these texts is that the same idea form into existence underlies all kinds of design whether you know it is the um, it's a water bottle um, it is a house it's a garden it's a city it's a world um, you're bringing form into existence and that form of course has you know functions and so on but um, by measuring and ordering space in the minds of the ancients, this was how they, uh, they designed, they measured and ordered space. And the system of measurement was based upon the body. So you see how the human body is um, kind of a linking thread um, in, um, in um, thinking about the cosmos, in understanding um, uh, what forms should be used um, to create space um, and um, let us see um, a few mandals. Um, this one is taken from Kapila Vatsayan's book, The Square and the Circle in uh, Indian Arts and um, she makes a point that um, architecture and arts are, are you know, they are um, governed by the same principles. So there is kind of a unity, you know, in how in sculpture, theater, the fine and performing arts and architecture. Uh, and this unity resides in, in the body and, the, and, and, its, um, and its movement and how it inhabits, inhabits space and how space a square and the body are one and the same. Okay, I think I'm going, I'm losing you. Are you following me here? We just saw the Vastu Purusha Mandal. We saw an organic form fitted into a geometric form, right? So, um, for instance, in a in a dance drama, as the dancer is moving onto the stage, and this goes back to Nati Shastra, as the dancer is moving into the stage, the stage is designed in the form of a, a, a unit, a square unit, could be 8 by 8, 16 by 16. And there is a center to that, right? And the dancer's pose, especially in dance forms like Bharat Natyam, is geometricizing the body. Uh, would you like to say a little bit about this? Uh, so you're right here. So this specific figure in uh, Bharatnatyam, the central axis right from the head to the foot on either side is very symmetrical. So when we perform all performing arts uh, as per the Nati Shastra, we have equal... Uh, uh, 
there is the right and the left are equally given importance so whether you stand in whichever form as mandala sthana sthanaka what we call where the feet is together the hands stretched out exactly the way it is if you draw a straight line passing through the head right through the backbone and to the feet you find both the arms are stretched outstretched hands and there is symmetry on both sides so that is precisely what she is talking about the mandala sthana sama mandala we call this pose so this is true of all dance forms be it kathak odissi uh, kuchipudi bharatanatyam you will find this throughout and the basis of that is natya shastra obviously i've noticed it particularly in bharatanatyam uh, where you know the the limbs are arranged you know like yantra like in triangular forms but you're right i think um, the mandal the, the human body is a mandal the mandal is a human body um, just as we saw in the vastu purush mandal and here in the performing arts you know that is that is what is happening um, and um i want to say a little bit about um um the knowledge base um so uh, we have uh, there are treatises and they have been translated some of them have been translated and this is um uh, these are manuals okay and um um the architect in these manuals was given a very high place vishwakarma he is the creator of universe he is architect the gods employed him as a architect in reality um uh, what we see is kind of a composite architect the sthapati um um who is assisted by a draftsman called sutragahi who is in turn assisted by the carver whatever the material may be and by the joiner and finisher and then there are girls who were responsible you know for the beautiful temples few of them survive today the sompuras of western india the sthapatis of tamil nadu and these shilpa shastras again were compiled between 500 ce to um 16 1516 um for instance mansara i think the date goes back to 500 whereas um uh um uh, prasad mandara 15th century um and these are um uh, you know these they pra- these were kept uh, these manuals were used by um uh uh temple builders as well as by uh builders of palaces the great palaces uh, um of medieval india so we have patrons um uh who took a very active interest uh and you know patronized um uh, uh the 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 sthapati and above the sthapati was actually usually a brahman priest by the name you know called sthapaka and he was a main advisor and so the royal patronage was very very crucial um in um i think developing this canon of knowledge um for unfortunately architecture schools today do not consult um first of all these vastu shastras shilpa shastras shilpa means you know art and vastu shastras are part of the part of them they do not consult because of you know poor translation you know lack of access um and i think most mo- above all they are seen as um manual codes which have no relevance you know to building today um so uh, but that was not always the case it wasn't as if only temples were you know um were, were built according to the shastras um every in every sphere of place making uh, whether it was a humble small dwelling to um uh to um sectors urban sectors and even a city um jaipur that i'll just talk about in a minute um okay um so i'm going to go through these um kind of quickly because um i think what was important you uh, the important points of discussion we have already covered them um the earliest structures that we find um on uh, 
depicted on stupa reliefs are, are of sanctuaries uh, like the tree sanctuary. So if you see um, um, people worshipping here on, on, your, on the left um, and on your right in both, um, you see a worship going on. On the left is the seat of the Buddha and there is a, this is the Bodhi tree and there is a gallery around, built around it. On your right is, you know, um, the stupa, the containing the relics of the Buddha, but again there is a gallery. And the reason I, I put these two slides up is because I wanted to draw your attention to circumambulation. And by circumambulate, by worshipping, circumambulation is part of worship and, you know, by going around, one is, again, you know, um, paying obeisance um, to the relic, which, you know, is stands for the Buddha himself. And we see, you know, uh, Buddhist architecture, um, the caves, um, uh, um, oh, the elaborate Chaitya halls are imitating the uh, timber um, detailing in stone. So in these caves, we have, um, of Western India, we have uh, Chaitya halls, uh, we see um, temples, uh, the oldest rock cut, you know, shrines of Hinduism and of Jainism as well. Again, um, I want to draw your attention to the ambulatory passage in the uh, Chaitya Graha in the Elora, Caves of Elora. See the stupa is, you know, do you see the ambulatory passage and how on um, the roof we see the timber beams. I, um, also, um, the Chaitya window, this people shaped window that will be repeated also in Hindu temple architecture. The earliest temples, the Lark Khan temple, 5th century, uh, the Durga temple, uh, uh, a few centuries later, not, you know, not really too far away from each other. But um, the Lark Khan temple, there is really no spire. In the Durga temple, we have a kind of a stunted spire. Okay. And Again, in the Durga temple, there is an ambulatory passage, so emphasizing, you know, the, the act of Parikrama. Uh, the, uh, the, the, I saw the, I, the figure there on, on, uh, next to the Larkhan temple, it shows the plan and it shows the isometric view. And here in this isometric view, you can see how timber uh, detailing um, was imitated in stone. These diagrams are taken from George Mitchell's book, The Hindu Temple. It's a really a very good book uh, for those who have had no introduction to the meaning and form of Hindu temple. I recommend it. And I take these diagrams from, from a page in the book, which shows how energy is emanating. So there is the, there is the tower and it's linking to the sky, the, you know, there's upward thrust. There is the um, circumambulatory path around the shrine. And then um, from the center, from the Garbhagriya, there are these lines of forces emanating in all directions. Um, James Ferguson, who um, my students read about, um, was the, um, you could say, the father of um, architectural history and he got it wrong when he wrote the book in 1876. He said there are two, the, 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 the um, North and South Indian architectural styles, temples, architectural styles are so different that they were built by two different races altogether. They have nothing in common with them. It wasn't until the 20th century that um, uh, an Austrian professor in Calcutta University by the name of Stella Cambridge showed um, that the idea of the temple is the same, north, south, east, west. And she was the one who kind of interpreted the temple for us as um, a temple, as a, as a symbol of the cosmos. Anyway, this uh, is taken from Adam Hardy's book, um, Temples of India, and it does show two distinct languages, the Nagara style and the 
Ravida style. And um, the, if you look closely at the sketch, you will see what I was talking about when I said the adicule is multiplied and is repeated. And again, this sketch is kind of interesting. Um, in the Khandariya Mahadev temple uh, in Khajrao in central India, this idea of emergence of upward growth um, as well as downward manifestation. Are you with me here? You see what I'm saying? The little shrine, in this case, you know, the Kutisthamba, the pillars with the finial, repeated again and again and again, over and over and over again. And it is, the tower is tapering to a single point. Where is that point going? Where is that point going? What is at the top of the temple? The flag. Did you see the flag? Yes, we see a lot of flags, yeah. But what is the small structure at the top of the temple? Yeah, of course, there are flags. What? Kalash, yes. And what does the Kalash contain? Yes, and what is that nectar <laughs> of immortality, right? <laughs> so that's the idea. You go to the top, to, to the unity, the principle of, you know, of, of everything leading to one of immortality. But then as you go downwards, the forms are, are multiplying, they're proliferating. And so the, you know, there is, so the, the universe is growing and it's growing and it's growing. That's the idea. And to finally dissolve, end. <laughs> So, a multiple projection, um, things are coming out from the Chatya arts, you know, um, it's becoming, you know, it's, it's, it is, it is, they're coming out, it's like a telescope um, or, or progressive multiplication, a smaller entity, the Alpu Vimana is becoming, you know, it's larger and larger. Okay, I'm going to go through this quickly because uh, Michelle said he asked me to spend um, a little time, you know, going over uh, towards the end with you on what we saw and uh, discussed today. Um, so, uh, Mandal is a house of God, the Brahma is in the center. If it is a house, you know, a traditional house, it is a courtyard, you know, it is the, you know, um, uh, if it is a temple, it's a Garbhagriya. And so, you know, there are, you know, 64 squares, 81 squares. But it's not only the plan that we should look at. Um, we should also look at the walls of the temple. And it is a plan, of course, that's connected to the elevation. And here we see the principle of staggering. And so, you know, there's projection and there is recess. Going out, going in. And, and in a seven Rath Shikhar, it becomes like a, the, the square becomes a star. There's so much projection and recession. And it becomes like a dy dynamic entity. And when you stand in front of, of, a, of a structure like this, it feels as if it is rotating. It's of course fixed, static. But it's perceptual, it's a, it creates a perceptual illusion of rotation. So the earliest, you know, um, rocket temples in Mahabalipuram, um, a simple hut, right, in Draupadi Ratha, Ganga and Yamuna on either side of the entry, Dharm Raj Ratha, you see now progressive multiplication, the small, um, the small shal, shahala, you know, it's a barrel vaulted um, roof uh, with the chaitya window and then at the top, um, a octagonal dome. Um, by the time we come to 13th century in Keshav temple at Somnathpur, um, uh, actually, you know, here we have three shrines with a mandap in front and then all around you have the cloister. Um, um, the recession and projection is so intricate. Um, I, keep, I keep saying, you know, that the line between architecture and sculpture really becomes diffuse uh, here and the material is soapstone. Uh, 
In Khandariya Mahadev Temple in Khajrao, um, the crescendo, you know, the small, you know, the small beak speaks, you know, um, embedded, uh, the smallest fire, the shaker, uh, sh this is called the shakari style of architecture, embedded into the larger one and, and then again the crescendo to the top. Um, so if I say that this is um, an imitation of Mount Meru, Mount Kailash, I would not be far from the truth, you know. A, a perfect, you know, mimetic um, mimesis of a natural archetype. Or in Lakshman temple, um, again the mandal here is, um, so the Garbhagriha, the ambulatory passage, then the Ardh Mandapa, the Big Mandapa, and then all on a, on a terrace with four smaller shrines at the corners. This actually is a Vishnu temple, uh, Mukteshwara temple in Bhubaneswar, um, uh, the spire over the Garbhagriya, uh, the, uh, the pyramidal form over the Mandap. And our own very sun temple uh, and the tank, all the entire complex in access with each other. I just visited it like three weeks ago. And the guy told me, you know, all about, um, all about, you know, um, time um, represented in the built form. Um, Surya himself, you know, with his seven horses <coughs> on the on the outer wall, the interior, um, the pillars representing <coughs> the months of the year. Um, and of course, you know, the, the sculptural forms are texts really, the Ramayana and the Mahabharat. Okay, and I am going um, down south, Brihadeshwara Temple at Tanjugu. Um, and now we see a difference here in terms of where the towers are. So if you look at the Kaveri Delta in Tamil Nadu, you see Kaveri, which is the southern Ganga has some of the most magnificent temples and temple complexes and temple cities. Um, and again, it is, um, you know, the confluence of the river that is celebrated. Um, that is the case uh, 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 in, in, uh, in the location that, that's what is happening here in Tanjavur. Um, Sri Rangam Island is actually an island um, uh, between the two branches of the Kaveri River. And um, the tower here over the Garbhagriya is there, different style. You see, you know, the, the dome at the top. But now we see the temple enclosures and their gateways becoming taller and taller and taller. Gopurams, you know, Gopurams is, you know, named after cow entry or whatever. And by the the time we come, you know, here um, to 17th century, all of this building is happening between 11th and 17th century. The Cholas were great builders, um, but the Nayaks kept on building. And um, the Sri Rangam temple, um, the Ranganath temple in Sri Rangam is really a temple city, so to speak, because um, uh, uh, it is so huge and um, it really does, I think, capture the idea of the cosmos as imagined in the Puranas, which was in the form of um, seven oceans and six islands, they, you know, all in a concentric shape. And through, you know, through the gateways um, and around the praka, around the sanctuary uh, in these ambulatory passageways in the prakar, energy eman, eman, uh, emanates and, and reaches out um, into the profane world beyond. And as you know, temples are very lively and vibrant places uh, beyond the Garbhagriya, the Mandaps are places of performance, um, but the, the, the commerce also enters, you know. Um, so here we see um, in the Nath temple entry, um, Utensils are being sold, and 
the Minakshi temple is also a very, uh, again, at the, you know, it's a very large complex and um, it's originally located, you know, in, Tele, in Tele forest and now, of course, the city of Madurai envelops all around it. Um, I uh, want to uh, talk a little, very briefly about um, the Parikrama ar around um, Arunachal Hill. Now, this has, I think, become very well known, very famous. Um, and Arunachal Hill is called the Hill of, meaning the dawn. And it's, I guess, orange reddish. Has anyone done this Parikrama? Michelle, have you? <laughs> it's very popular, I believe. <laughs> um, but what's so interesting about this 14 kilometer uh, Parikrama um, is that you visit a number of shrines. Uh, um, Arunachal is um, a linga, really. It's synonymous with Shiva. And the temple is again a huge temple. Um, uh, here, um, the linga is the linga of fire. And on Shivratri, on top of the Arunachal hill, a giant fire is lit. Um, and it's, uh, you know, it is a very, I think, spectacular sight. Um, um, and there is, of course, circumambulation going on, going on. All the other gods and goddesses of Tiruvannamalai come here in the temple, uh, go around the temple, and then they're taken around the hill also. So do you see now the system going on here of correspondence? The hill is a linga. The linga is inside the temple. The temple is an architectonic version of something natural, a natural archetype. The mandal formed by circumambulation, the circle, transformed into um, uh, a rectangle, a square pattern uh, of the temple uh, and enacted by the movement of people and deities. I don't know if I have time, uh, but I'm going to just um, uh, talk very briefly um, about um, how mandal and temple are are also uh, the mandal should not be just associated with the temple, but it underlies all place making uh, in uh, traditional thinking. And uh, in a city, the pride of place, of course, goes. The center is where the temple is, and it's, you know, that would be located close to the royal complex. Um, but in a in a in a in an ordinary neighborhood, um, um, we find the same form being imitated, an introverted form, and I and I think the courtyard form, which is seen in all parts of India except in Himachal Pradesh, you know, is um, a very introvert, introverted form, very suitable for. For, uh, for the family structure, which never, you know, remain um, a, a, a single unit. It, it grew and then it shrank. So just as the household increased in size in a patriarchal structure, uh, uh, you know, where, where the sons brought in their wives, you know, the household grew. So would the house grow. And when the family split, there was segmentation of the house too. Um, settlement typology, there are the, the Shastras uh, have a few uh, diagrams for us um, for building uh, cities and villages. Um, Uh, the plan of Jaipur, how many of you are familiar with this plan? How many of you have visited Jaipur, lived in Jaipur? A lot of you. <laughs> like the place? What do you think is going on there? <laughs> it 
it's planned. So there's unity in the treatment, right? And I think that's what adds to the to the feeling of of of, of uh, to the aesthetic experience. This is a uh, mandal. Uh, Sabai Jai Singh has actually hired a sthapati. You know, he was an astronomer himself, astrology astronomer himself, and they drew up a nine square, a prasthara di mandal diagram. But what happened? Well, topography intervened. And so, instead of being not south oriented, it had to be shifted 22 degrees. The center was a palace square. That was where the main temple was located. <clears throat> and even one of the squares had to be shifted. So, it's like on one side. And <clears throat> some of, you know, some very interesting architecture. The pink city is actually, you know, not really pink, but, you know, it's like <laughs> called the pink city. But the same idea that self-similarity, the square is then... Um, the nine squares and each square becomes a module in the larger square or rectangle and it's duplicated at smaller scales. Same with the streets. The main streets are 108 feet wide. Um, that is the east-west street. The north-south streets might be are, are exactly half of that, 54 feet. And then we go to 27 and then to so the smallest streets are nine and six feet. And I should say that some architects um, like Charles Correa did think about the mandal as a generative diagram for architecture of today. And um, Jawahar Kala Kendra is, you know, again a nine square diagram and imitating the, the, the fallen off square to um, the Shukra, he calls it, the center being the, the, the Surya Kund. <coughs> Um, Haveli's courtyard pattern and finally I think um, in in uh, the island to our south in Colombo when pa the parliamentary complex was built by Jeffrey Bava, the most famous uh, Sinhalese architect, he used a mandal pattern to lay out the assembly hall and uh, the ancillary structures. Um, surrounded by water. So it's actually a, an island uh, uh, parliament. So I'm going to stop here. <clears throat>